It's been a year since the world confronted the COVID-19 pandemic, and the lives of the people around the world have changed. I'm Chaz Smooth with Catholic News Service. And I'm Carol Zimmerman with Catholic News Service. Today, we're looking at how the pandemic has impacted chaplains at Catholic hospitals. What did they experience also on the front lines, but in a very different way this year? What got them through, what they learned, and what they see going forward? Today, we're gonna to go ahead and talk with Chance Beeler, a chaplain with a hospital group in Missouri, and also Greg Nunebel, who's with St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Charles, Missouri. Welcome, gentlemen. Looking back at the year, um, maybe walk us through a little bit of how your ministry even had to change, that you maybe you couldn't go into rooms with people, or maybe you were dealing also not just with patients, but patients and families and colleagues. So maybe just kind of an overview of what your year was like, or for your colleagues, what the year was like. Sure. Um, looking back at 2020, it was certainly a year of change and adaptation. Um, and we journeyed through this time, um, along with our, our colleagues in the various ministry uh, duties that they have. Um, one of the things that um, my team has been called to do is to be very supportive for our staff, nurses, doctors, those that are um, working with the patients and families on a, on a constant basis to make sure that they have resilience training, make sure that they have someone to talk to um, and feel heard. My team recognized early on that we, our ministry is really one that typically steps up when there's a challenge or a trauma or change. So we're used to leading and change. Um, and as you mentioned a few minutes ago, just the fact that we are hitting a year into this um, was interesting because we've been going at this like a marathon. And now all of a sudden we have this other word, it's an anniversary or it's been a year. And that consideration made us pause to think, wow, we've been doing this for a year. Um, when we work with emergencies, typically they, they last maybe a couple hours or a couple days, but a year is, a, is really a lot different. So it's really important that resiliency piece. And uh, we've developed some really close relationships with our teams. Uh, we take care of each other as chaplains. Um, and we also then can better take care of uh, the nurses and doctors and, and all those in our teams, including environmental service folks and food service, everyone. It's been a journey for us all. So looking back, what do you think are the, the things that stand out for you as just so challenging and conversely so so rewarding or so where you were able to connect people with their faith and bring them comfort? I think initially what was challenging for us was this sudden leap into technology, kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, we had known that there had been folks doing telechaplaincy for a while and we were suddenly uh, supplied with iPads and we were calling patients in rooms um, that were isolation patients because we were trying to conserve PPE so that those frontline folks can have those first and that we wouldn't run short. We were asked to find new ways to connect with those patients and connect them with their families. Then we had our visitor policy change for a while um, and we were trying to connect folks with their clergy and their families and their friends via iPad Zoom meetings um, so we had to learn how to do that too. Um, what we found though, was that our patients really appreciated the fact that we were calling into the rooms, we were doing our best um, in these circumstances and they appreciated having someone to talk to, to pray with even over the phone. Mm. So we were a bit hesitant at first and concerned, but we fully embraced it now. And we find it's very helpful um, for, especially with folks that have family across the United States, we can bring them together quite quickly. And it's more than just a telephone call. We can do those Zoom meetings. And did you feel that, was it a little bit of a, not just the technology part, but to reach out to people, uh, was that a, a hurdle to overcome just to be able to, I mean, normally maybe you could touch their arm or hold their hand in prayer. Was that a, a real challenge? Or how did you overcome that, that barrier that you're not right beside someone? Yeah, and, and, and you're exactly right. Um, some of those barriers being distance, even if you're able to go into a room, uh, we had to change our practice to, to keep six, eight feet away. Um, part of that is we don't want to uh, spread germs from person to person. And we become very aware of the fact that we could potentially carry something from one room to another. 
Um, so, you know, we made sure we, we kept that distance. Um, a, another aspect is that we were always wearing masks, not just in particular rooms. And to some, that's a communication challenge, uh, especially if they use, you know, reading lips is some, some of what they do. Um, so that became kind of an interesting change for us as well. And we, they also need to know that we're smiling and you can't, and they, we all learn to uh, look at people's eyes to tell if they're smiling or not. Um, so distance is a big piece of it. Now, if we did need to hold someone's hand, we, we could put a glove on, you know, and there are circumstances where we would do that. Um, but in the most extreme cases, we, we would typically try not to uh, have contact. So it became part of our ritual when you go in a room is to recognize the fact that I'm going to stand over here. And that is just to keep you and me, we're going to keep everyone safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what we're doing. Right. Um, and, and call it out so it doesn't kind of seem like you're afraid of me. Well, no, this is just what we're doing now. It isn't, you can even make a joke about it. Say, isn't this interesting that we're having to do this this way now? But really, we had to own that, you know, and really work through how are we going to really walk into that room and not, that, not let that be a barrier in our visits. You are walking into a room with people who have COVID. Um, how concerned are you for your, for your own health? Just to answer that question about walking in rooms with folks with COVID, I think it's important to know that we don't make that our um, common practice. Um, we first seek out ways to do that um, either via phone or uh, virtually if the patient's able to visit. Um, we encourage um, our clergy to pray from outside the room as well, um, unless there's a need to go in. And then we partner with the nurses to make sure that we're doing absolutely everything right, even though we do it all the time. So we don't miss anything to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect ourselves as well. We're grateful that the shortage that we were concerned about early on with PPE has resolved so that we're not prevented from going in those rooms. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're also being cautious and not overexposing, even after getting a vaccine, uh, we're still being very cautious with that. Um, and that's for our own safety. And also, again, like I mentioned before, you go into a room with someone with COVID, you don't want to spread that to the next patient. So, you know, we're very careful about that as well. Well, you've also had the challenge, even if it's not a COVID patient, that may be, uh, at least early on, there's been so much isolation that maybe you couldn't even go in a room, regardless if they had COVID or not. Maybe you still had to, wasn't there the isolation that people couldn't go in rooms or? Correct. So prior to COVID, we would go in isolation rooms of a different type, um, and we are used to using PPE. Um, but during the early days, especially when we were planning for the surge and making sure that we were being conservative about our use of PPE, we stopped going in any um, of those rooms initially unless we absolutely needed to, uh, to take care of something in another way. Um, so we would call um, those patients on the phone. Do people frequently... Um, um underestimate the help that you all give families? And did the um, pandemic really pose more um, obstacles to that? And did families suffer during all of this? I think that's an interesting question. Um, and it's hard to say, I think not having folks available at the bedside as much as they would typically be was hard on families. Um, that was hard on the patients as well. But one thing we found in our department was there were times that we were asked to be present with a family member in their stead. Um, perhaps um, there was an iPad in the room so the family could be there virtually, um, but they'd ask the chaplain to be present during that visit as kind of a, you know, a go-between um, and a presence for that family member for, for peace and consolation. Um, so we were, we were asked to do that, to kind of stand in from time to time as well. You know, I, I can imagine, you know, just in my own personal life, how difficult knowing family members were in the hospital and not being able to visit. Um, but I also recognize the value of being able to vir virtually visit, um, which was an added tool, but at least we had that. Can you tell me any one specific story that really stands out to you in this last year? This was early in the pandemic back in May. There was a 40 year old gentleman who uh, contracted COVID and it got uh, severe uh, to the point where uh, he was intubated. Uh, he was a very young person. And, you know, it, it, especially earlier in the pandemic, the older dem demographics was 
particularly vulnerable. So that's why his case was unique at the time. Uh, he was not from St. Louis. His family doesn't live here. Um, like I said, he was intubated for three weeks in our ICU. And uh, despite being incapacitated, uh, the care that these clinicians showed him was amazing. And when he was um, taken off the vent, he uh, made a comment. And when he finally came to, you know, he made a comment that he recognized the voices of the people who were in the room mm -hmm. with him during his care. Uh, he made that audible connection with them. And it was just a very profound moment uh, that we talked about in our safety huddle as you know, we were looking for the little wins. It was such a tough time, still is, of course, but um, that was something that we really held on to. Um, and you know, during this person's stay, our clinicians worked with his sister to keep him, uh, to keep her and his family informed about her care, uh, because especially in the ICU, family partnership is such a critical component of that treatment and recovery. So they really advocated for him in the absence of his family. And there was one particular time, probably a few times where the sister asked his clinicians to, to pray for prayer, to hold his hand. Uh, you know, this is all done over Zoom, uh, but it was, it was after their recovery and it was a reunion of sorts between him, his sister, who at that point they were together um, and all of the caregivers in that ICU, uh, several of them anyway, uh, and the caregivers had put together a photo book of themselves because he, he described how you know, all the, the nurses and the doctors, they're all masked up. All he could see were the eyes. So it's really hard for him to really connect in a meaningful way. Um, but they put together a picture book that they surprised him with during that call. And uh, it was really amazing. And there were some uh, moments where his sister described that spiritual component, how that came out and how it got him uh, got him through that and, and gave them hope even when uh, times were the darkest. So that's one particular story that that does stand out that did have that spiritual com component where we heard that firsthand experience that, hey, this really helped us through a, a very dark time. And, you know, turning to Christ was, um, you know, one thing that we could always hold, hold on to. And thank you for joining us today.